Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. This is uh, this is work day, and it is my duty and pleasure to talk about work today. Uh, it was it has been an interesting start all day. I left uh, my house out in Owen County. Uh, my wife was very sick in bed. I was afraid I wasn't going to be able to leave her which meant that I had to walk the dog and do all this stuff before getting here in a short amount of time, and I was still uh, kind of thinking about the talk and all that, so. Uh, but I made it. And, of course, we've had internet down. Is it back up? It's, it's still not back up. All right, all right. Uh, um, okay. Uh, Of course, sitting here before starting this talk, I was thinking of a different places to start from. Uh, I often think about attitude, my own attitude, when I approach something. And uh, I found myself uh, considering how, how many times I've approached a job and thought, how this is just going to be a snap. I'm just going to dive right into it. It's just going to, I'm just going to sail through it, you know, or it's a really simple job. And about 90% of the time, that is never the case. Uh, I'll start something and then uh, something breaks. Uh, you need more than you have. Uh, it's more of a problem than you thought. You end up having to uh, redo your plans and, uh, so I've kind of adopted this saying, and it actually belongs to Jethro Tull. It's a song of his. It's nothing is easy. And it's easy for me to say that when I approach a job these days, because nothing is easy, even though it looks like it. So um, uh, kind of a preamble to all of this is that San Shin, in fact, uh, our uh, uh, brave leader, uh, Hoko here, is working through what Sanchin's style is. And uh, last week she handed over 33 pages of what she has so far. I think it's probably going to grow if I know Hoko. <laughs> and uh, part of this is... Uh, about work, what we do here. That brings up something I started to talk about some time ago. It occurred to me that we do three basic things here. Uh, Dharma study, zazen, and work. I think my first talk beginning a work period was uh, about this very thing and a, the idea of a three-legged table. A two-legged table would not stand very well. So this is a very solid three-legged table. Uh, Dharma work and study. Dharma study, I'm sorry. Zazen and work. This nice table. And here sits, sits Buddha and all the things around Buddha are practice. Include San Shin there. Include everything there. Uh, work. Uh, as... Hoko puts it in the 33 pages she handed me, uh, part of it, uh, and I've stolen her title for this, is the Gateway to Dharma Study. So it's... Uh, my thought connecting with this, to somehow connect attitude, should be on these work days, how we approach this place. Uh, all of the work that happens here, uh, Hoko made a general sum of it. Uh, work here, practice San Shin, uh, in general, it includes activities that support the practice calendar, such as morning soji, ringing bells, chidan, or taking care of the altars, cooking for retreats, uh, giving instruction for zazen, 
Uh, today it's the heavier lifting going on. The, uh, the gardens, the projects I want to engage and get going on here. Uh, I hope it's going to be a busy day and I uh, hope it's kind of a fun day too. But I want to talk about the uh, way we need to really think about this, the proper attitude we bring to this place in practicing zazen, in practicing here, and work practice, dharma study. Uh, so, it's really just so much more than volunteering. This is really important to understand. It's easy to volunteer and go spend a few hours and do something. But uh, when you approach it with that idea that I'm here doing a good thing, uh, that's not the idea for this. Uh, I'm going to use, I think this is hoja -san's words. Uh, this is directly taken from Hoko's uh, tome, I call it. Uh, work overall. It's a practical study of the interconnectedness and the nature of community as a manifestation of Indra's net. Whether that community is the practitioners within the temple or beings in the entire ten directions, ten directional world. Um, I know that we go to Indra's net, often here, Hoja's son often points it out, draws it on the board. Uh, but there's a part there that's a little hard to draw and a little hard to think about. There are the jewels at the intersections of this net. The jewels represent the kind of vision that's uh, reflected of the rest of the net. If you think of a diamond, multifaceted, if you look at the heart of that jewel, you see the rest of the net. You see it all come together there. That's the way I like to think of this when we come here to work on these days. Uh, so, work as embodied dharma. When we're out doing whatever we're doing, it's really a kind of meditation we're doing. Uh, so when we approach life and work with an attitude, as Dogen writes in the Tenzo Kyokun, we are living the reality of pure life day by day. I love that. That is, uh, that's when my work is really happening nicely. That's when uh, I feel like it's found its flow. And that's one thing I've talked about here a few times is uh, the opposite of dukkha is sukha. Sukha is the zone, the flow. Uh, it's a beautiful thing you find that. Uh, we, you know, I've talked about uh, my time in the arts and uh, had a uh, lecture on John Cage at one point. Uh, I've always loved this talking about going into the studio, uh, intending to work or to paint or to make music or whatever you do, and you carry your life and the rest of the world on your shoulders. And as you work away, you slowly slough these things off. And eventually you're left with yourself. And if you're really lucky, you leave. And it's just work. Um, so, I've gleaned a few things from the Tenzo Kyokun uh, that pertain directly to our work. All of this is, of course, Dogen. Uh, a lot of it has been filtered through Uchiyama. Uh, first of all, I want to talk a little bit about the joy of serving others. Dogen writes, The true bond established between ourselves and the Buddha is born of the smallest offering made with sincerity rather than of some grandiose donation made without it. Uh, so small gestures can loom really large. Uh, feeding someone 
offering incense. Uh, recently I was in uh, a laundromat and uh, there was a uh, Hispanic woman there and she couldn't get the stupid uh, uh, detergent dispenser to dispense detergent after she <laughs> dropped God knows how much money in there. So I just handed her my container and she took it and just kind of looked at me. She, I don't think she could speak English. And I just, just go use it, you know. And I felt good. She felt good. She was able to do what she needed to do. She had little kids around. You know, it was, that was all that happened. And uh, it's that kind of small gesture that's that, that offering. Uh, you know, there's the stepping in when, when it's needed, when you're lifting something into a, into a truck or something, or carrying things around here. Uh, people are really quick to step up and to help with things. Uh, it's really the expression of community when all that happens. It's when we're coming together and making that happen. The next thing would be treating each thing as the body of the Buddha. Uh, never performing tasks thoughtlessly or carelessly. Uh, Dogen quotes a Chan master. Use the property and possessions of the community as carefully as if they were your own eyes. So... When we think about that, you protect your eyes. We, we uh, something's thrown at your face, you close your eyes and turn your head away. Uh, and you, you shield your face. Uh, when you think of, pro of protecting the items and using them in this community, it's the same thing. I once remember hearing uh, Miyoya Roshi talk about uh, being at her first I think it was tea ceremony, and uh, the tea bowl was ancient, and she was terrified to use it. You know, even though you're on top, it's a tommy mats and all that. And she was terrified to use it, and she was just instructed that if you're afraid of that, you never allow your arm to leave the mat. In other words, you keep your elbows on the mat as you're holding this thing. You also always use two hands. Whenever we use anything in here, we always pick it up, pick up the incense burner, pick up the candles. Anything we're carrying, we're carrying with two hands. In fact, you carry with three fingers like this. And uh, I remember you discussing why we don't use these fingers to, <laughs> to do with clean yourself. So carrying anything like this, incense burner, candles, your meal bowls, anything. Um, wash water after our meals. Not carelessly, carelessly just discard it in the parking lot or on a, you know, out, out in the yard. You actually take it and put it, pour it on a tree or some, some plant we want to nourish. Um, approaching work without judgments or preference. Uh, for a Tenzo, that means we use the ingredients we have. Uh, for me, that means as much as I can using the tools I have available to me. Uh, that, that, I think, works for everybody. Uh, without judgment and preferences would also mean you don't desire one job over another. We take the jobs we're given. Soji happens here in the morning and there's a list of things and whoever is the uh, efficient that day will go through the list. First thing it comes up and of course we offer it to people but uh, eventually it comes down to uh, this needs to be done. Please do this. Being diligent in our activities.
There's the uh, famous story of when Dogen went to China as a young monk to find out about Zen. He encounters an old monk uh, drying mushrooms in the extremely hot sun. Uh, the story is that the tiles that they're standing on is so hot that it burns your feet. The sweat is just pouring off this poor monk. His uh, white eyebrows are just dripping with sweat. Uh, it was interesting, he's also apparently 68 degrees, which is how old I am right now. So <laughs> I thought that was uh, an interesting connection. So Dogen asked, why don't you get someone to help you? Or why don't you have someone else do this for you? Understanding that the elderly monk you know, could be endangering his health, health there in the hot sun. But the fact of the matter is, mushrooms don't dry very well in the moist shade. So the monk replied, others are not me. He was the only one who could be doing this. So strengthen your resolve, Dogen says. Devote your life spirit to surpassing the refinement of the ancient patriarchs and being ever more meticulous than those who came before you. Uh, it doesn't matter the job. It's always possible to bring something to it. Um, I've already spoken about this, but I'll, I'll bring it up again. Uh, the sukha of work. Uh, I've talked about the dukkha and the sukha and the flow, the total concentration that comes when you're in that place where nothing else matters but what your task is. Uh, something that uh, happened recently is I'm kind of the default maintenance person for my wife and her rental property. Uh, in the past couple of weeks, <laughs> I've been to this house twice to deal with uh, overflowing toilets. Not a joyous thing. Um, I, uh, uh, the first time was not too difficult. I simply took a plunger and went at it and then cleaned up my mess around it and, and left. The second time I encountered both a, a toilet and a sink that were just completely clogged up. And there's probably about 25 feet of pipe below in the basement that uh, are causing this. The, all the plumbing in this place is at least 25 years, if not 90 years old. Um, so I worked at it as best I could with uh, the plunger. Actually, I should say first, I came to it understanding that I was entering somebody's living space. I was a little uncomfortable. This uh, couple, uh, both wearing masks, they have a new baby, so they were concerned about the baby. And, you know, just the, you can think having a, a stuck toilet could be a lot of problems for a young couple and uh, having a child like this around. So just trying somehow to keep it all contained. Uh, I sat, I sat outside actually in my truck and thought about it for a little bit, what I needed to do. And what was required to get things going. So uh, getting the amount of tools from my vehicle, carrying a bucket inside, getting a, a particular kind of non-toxic uh, drain cleaner, uh, pipe cleaner, all of this stuff I had in place before I did it. And then uh, I tested the, uh, the toilet just to see what would go down course wouldn't work at first uh, so it's just a matter of pushing the handle a little bit watching it go down and then eventually getting the plunger in there and just really going at it and all of a sudden it washes out and goes away I was uh, concerned about having to come back because I, I think that what I'm eventually going to have to do is just replace the plumbing down in the basement so for the meantime there is a particular kind of chemical drain cleaner that's actually considered green. Uh, I poured enough of that in there. I had to instruct the people that 
don't use this until tomorrow. You'll be sorry. So uh, I was happy to hear the next day that everything was good and fine and working again. Hopefully it will stay that way for a while. But uh, the story that I'm putting out there was, it was just a matter of uh, really considering, not thinking again that, okay, this is going to be a quick and easy job because the first time it was quick and easy, the second time, because it was quick and easy, here I am again. This made me think, okay, I've got to somehow really solve the problem, at least for the, the, the near short term. Uh, so, just to put that out there again, it is no quick and easy task, and nothing is easy. Um, one of the last things I want to do today, I don't like to make these talks very long, but I have been reading an account of a uh, young Japanese fellow back in the early 90s. He was a designer in Tokyo. He uh, uh, decided that he was very tired of his work and he wanted to uh, see what it was like to be a priest or be a monk uh, at uh, Eheji. The title of this book is Eat, Sleep, Sit, My Year at Japan's Most Rigorous Zen Temple. Uh, the fellow's name is Keoru Nonomuro. Uh, this has been pretty fascinating considering, you know, my vocation here. So, uh, there is a point where he writes about manual labor at, a, at he, a Heiji, and I thought this would be interesting for everyone to hear. This is a little bit long, but uh, I'm going to put it out there. Manual labor, an integral part of Zen life, no less important than sitting itself is manual labor. This refers to the physical labor done in the monastery. In ancient India, monks were detached from all physical labor and devoted themselves only to spiritual labors. All the material needs were met by believers who provided alms and did any necessary work. In China, high esteem for physical work was tied to a practical turn of mind that resulted in the establishment of labor as a form of discipline. Life in a Christian monastery is also based on prayer and work, as in a Zen monastery. But the two religious traditions have, fundament, have a fundamentally uh, different approach to work. In the Christian monastic tradition, work is a means of supporting the life of prayer. Continued prayer is the goal, work the means. But for Zen practitioners, work has inherent spiritual value and is integral to the life of discipline. At Eheji, along with sitting, which is done morning and night, collective manual labor is done twice daily. There are two basic types of manual labor. One is done by the members of individual residences, the other by all trainees together. The, form, the former includes manual labor related to the official tasks of each residence, as well as cleaning of the residence and its surroundings. In our residence, the common quarters, our main task consisted of cleaning and bell ringing, and our manual labor, too, was cleaning the areas we were responsible for, including the monks' hall, the washroom, the walking corridor, the common quarters, the common quarters work area, and its washroom and toilet. These places weren't just cleaned as part of manual labor. They were also cleaned daily as part of the regular round of cleaning tasks. That's the great thing about cleaning at Eheji. It isn't done on special days or in special places, but takes place energetically every single day, whether or not there's any dirt to speak of. Manual labor done by the entire body of trainees is greater in scale and varies according to the season. In spring, there is raking to be done. Because the temple is surrounded by huge cedars, after the spring saw, thaw sets in, 
The ground is littered with dead leaves and branches brought down by the snow. Everyone should spread out. Everyone would spread out to rake them up and dispose of them. We also did river labor, wading out to the stream where dead leaves and branches swept along by the current would catch between the rocks and pile up. Attired in rubber boots and raincoats, we removed every bit of detritus. Fed by melting snow, the water was ice cold, and our hands and feet turned numb as we mutely picked up, picked up the river clean, leaf by leaf and twig by twig. In summer, we focused on one chore, weeding. The last let up on our part, the least let up on our part, and weeds spread everywhere, relentlessly. The compound is huge, the weeds persistent even with a hundred odd trainees laboring day after day. Human beings are no match for the laws of nature, nor should they be. Weeding at Eheji is not done in a frenzied attempt to get rid of all the weeds. It's natural that weeds grow and people pull them. It's equally natural that the weeds grow back. The point is not to get rid of weeds once and for all, but to carry out the simple, repetitive action of pulling them up. In summer, the scope of communal weeding extends beyond the monastery grounds to the surrounding hillsides. This is called mountain labor. We would go out on the steep hillsides and take a scythe to waste high ve vegetation. For days on end, we would swing our scythes vigorously under a cloudless azure sky, breathing in the heavy scent of cut grass while we listened to the distant cries of the Himalayan cuckoo. In autumn, we raked again. Mixed in with the cedars on the mount monastery grounds are maples and a variety of other deciduous trees that constantly scatter their leaves. Just as the weeds of summer would zealously proliferate, the fallen leaves of autumn went on piling up no matter how hard we rake. Leaves fall and people rake them. People rake them more, people rake them and more leaves fall. Until winter came, we devoted many long autumn days to this task. Eheji is famous for heavy snows that blanket it in winter. Before winter set in, we would set up shelters around the compound buildings to protect them from colossal snowfalls. This is called snow shelter labor. First, we would build a frame with stout wooden poles and then fasten on a screen made from wooden bamboo splits. The complex is huge. The building's high. Erecting snow shelters around each of the buildings in the complex takes an enormous number of woven screens and many, many days. Once this task is completed, Eheji is ready for the quiet of winter. When winter gets underway in earnest and snow starts to pile up, next is snow clearing labor. We cleared it away one shovel full at a time not only from the ground, but from the rooftops as well. No sooner would we finish than, without the least regard for our labors, another snowfall would begin, turning the world white again in the blink of an eye. Once again, we felt the power and grandeur of nature. Okay. Uh, I can take questions or comments or we can jump right on working, so. <laughs> I liked your observation that because this thing was easy, I was back again the next day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I thought this morning, I thought this morning I'd get up and I'd just go grab my books and everything and get out of the house, but it wasn't gonna happen. <laughs> so, we thought we were gonna have internet this morning. <laughs> I didn't expect to be scraping my windows this morning. Yeah, same here. It's always something, isn't it? Same here. <laughs> Stop taking Murphy with you. Pardon? Stop taking Murphy with you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, no questions? Any comments or questions in the gallery? Let's work. Let's work. Thank you, everyone.